We have a great show for you today. We're answering a ton of your questions, and we get into a lot of strategy and a lot of average draft position speculation talk. We're talking underdog. We're talking a lot of stuff on today's episode. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enjoy the episode. This is Alan Lazard, a.k.a. The Lazard King, wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers, and you're listening to Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome. To the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> A little bit disturbing. A little bit disturbing, but I wanted to illustrate how well my microphone is working today. Was the uh, so that's what the oh yeah was? Oh yeah, yeah. You had a little t- more disturbing or less? Disturbing? Yeah, I mean, I would mute it. Okay, I'd mute the <laughs> mic. Uh, welcome into the show, Thursday, June thirtieth, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Jason Moore, Andy Holloway, with you. Uh, Jay Grizz, I believe, is in the house. We also have uh, Al Borland turning some knobs back there. And the Borgogan is here. Uh, The Borgogan fresh off of a uh, inner office bet victory. Uh, This morning there was some really hotly debated uh, facts. I mean, basically, what happened, Kyle? I love this show, and I have for a long time, and I knew... Right. What our show is all about. The Big Salad, 2015. So, yeah, Papa Josh, uh, less wise than Kyle the Borgogan. Papa Josh is our community manager. Uh, and Kyle simply stated that we had a Big Salad t-shirt at one point in time. We have many nicknames mm-hmm. on this show. And you would need to go way back to remember the Big Salad. If you are listening right now and you're like, oh, the Big Salad, oh, yeah. Well, thank you. That's amazing because that was a long time ago. You are dedicated and you are amazing. Not only do you probably not remember that shirt, but you probably don't remember the player the shirt was based off of, which was Sean Drone. That's right. And I definitely did not remember the shirt. Your voice sounds so much better. Yeah, I know. It's great. I'll talk about that too. But uh, we do have, we got a mailbag show today, news to talk about, uh, new contract extension for Terry McLaurin. Quick question to get into. But, anyways, the, the. what happened is is Kyle won a bet of whether we ever had this shirt. This is how long ago it was. It was it was seven years ago. And Papa Josh lost, which means that the Borgogan got to choose the lunch that Papa Josh ate today. Mm. And <laughs> you, you didn't make it easy on him. It was a mushroom egg. White egg white wrap. wrap with a tall glass of milk mm-hmm. warm warm milk and some fishy grits it was very kind of yeah, you yeah al guy. borland played a role in that punishment as well but glad to have you here and well done you are you are wise uh the big salad Sean drone was we called him that because sometimes your team needs you need you know, spice and exciting foods, but sometimes you just need a salad. Yeah, eat your vegetables type. It's just someone that's like, you know, it's not exciting, but it's going to it's gonna be helpful for you. And then I will not get into all of the details because, I mean, it would be like reading a, a 10-page novel, but you can check out Al Borland's Twitter. Jason hasn't sounded the same on this show for three, two, or, three or four episodes. Two Footballers episodes and Spitballers episode 200 my voice sounded a little hollow. A well, little... just like give me an example of the oh, difference between sure. like it was instead of sounding like this, it sounded more like this. Right. And we were we had seen some feedback and we pride ourselves mm-hmm. on uh, high quality audio production. Yeah. Give it give an example again. It sounded oh, like what? You know, just like if I was going to talk maybe through a piece of plastic. Yeah. So you can go read the story. Uh, basically, Al Borland turned the studio upside down trying to he replaced everything he could. Trying to figure out what was going on. Little did he know that a piece of plastic was stuck in the end of a pop filter. <laughs> <laughs> it was wild. But we're back. You sound great. Thank and you. Uh, more, I think, you sound like more of an authority on the topics at hand. Absolutely. And less like you're, you know, over a PA system. So 
Thank you for joining us today. Twitter at the FF Ballers. If you want to follow us, follow us on social media, ultimatedraftkit.com. If you want to check that out, the draft analyzer is out tomorrow. Here's the quick question, Jason. This one comes in from Instagram. It's one we see every year. And I like this question because it means people care about this. But the question is, are there any rules that a, a, a commissioner can put into place to encourage more trading in a redraft league? So the headline is, I want this league to be great. I want, you know, a great league means people are trading players and talking about players. Are there any ways you can legislate that? What What if you had um, minimum five trades or you're out next year as as a rule? I mean, that would be ridiculous. That would be absurd. And no, the, 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 the short answer to this as far as um, rules that a GM can put into place, there, there really aren't any, uh, I, I don't believe, that will incentivize trading. One rule that will help it, um, it doesn't really incentivize it, but it does aid a little bit, is getting rid of the veto timer. Um, when you have that timeline of like, okay, I once I accept a trade, now it's got a 24-hour wait until this player's on my team. When we used to play in leagues like that back, you know, in the olden days, mm -hmm. when it was old busted, it, the it big would, salad days. You'd, yeah, go on. you'd wait until after the waiver wire period runs to find out what your needs are, and then there's a game on Thursday, and it's like if I don't get this trade done in an hour, I'm not even going to be able to use this player this week if they play it on a Thursday. So get rid of that. It will allow it. But I think it's more about the camaraderie of the league, the the um interaction between the league mates outside of just trades that will actually get trading going the most in your league. Yeah, and it's not really a rule, but you could centralize the communication, which is something we've said many times on the show. It could be a Slack channel. It can be whatever, a, a Facebook group. It doesn't really matter as long as you're all in the same place where people talk about what happens in the leagues. People can respond. You know what's fun is when you do a trade, and then 10 other managers in the league all have opinions about who got robbed, which trade was better for who. We always put a poll up in oh, our absolutely. leagues right away because we want to win the poll immediately. And we want to shame someone. Right. Uh, whoever you know made the boneheaded side of the trade, they need to have that bus driven over them. Um, it really is about the camaraderie of the league and the entertainment of the league to incentivize people trading more and more. I remember back in the day when – the OG podcast started, which is not the fantasy footballers, but your guys's podcast, you and just Mike. For, just for our original league. Just for the league of record, for the other 10 years listening, and you had a trade. 20, 20 years, Jason. <laughs> they didn't let. Oh, that's right. You I know guess, what I mean? The, yeah. Everybody's got two ears. Uh, full stereo sound. Right. Um, yeah, so you had a trade of source Rex on that. And I, I remember trying to get a trade to go through, like adding an extra pick because I just wanted to make the podcast. So the communication among your league is probably the most valuable thing. Fantasy football is fun. Have your league be fun. A good example. There was a, a time just a couple of years ago when our good friend Al Borland uh, was trying to trade for Christian McCaffrey. He was on the block and he was over to my house in the summer for a, for a pool party. And, and, and I knew that Christian McCaffrey was on the block, and they were so close to getting him. And so I went inside, and I worked a deal, and I got Christian McCaffrey. And how did Jeremy find out about it? Me cannonballing over his head saying, I got CMC, sucker. And he was like, wait, is that serious? Is that true? I was so close to having that deal done, and I was so mad that you beat me to it. Oh, yeah, it that was after good. you washed him out of the pool? Uh, Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, time to jump into some news. News and notes from around the league. Money, 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 money. Well, it happened. Terry McLaurin, three-year deal with the Washington Commanders. $71 million. Wow, this is true, huh? $28 million signing bonus, the most for a wide receiver ever. Yeah, I mean, it's... Can we just get rid of the most ever talk? Because <laughs> every time someone signs... Yeah, it's, it's a sliding scale, ever. right? Yeah, I mean, it you'll never get... It changes over time. You'll never get Inflation. rid of that talk because I think the players... 
that matters to them. They want to sign a deal that they could say it's the most ever, and then they feel good about it, even though they know that will last for about 10 minutes until the next deal. For instance, now that Terry McLaurin's deal is done, I would expect a deal for Debo and a deal for DK Metcalf to be right around the corner. This has been the summer of wide receiver deals. Like, good year to need an extension as a wide receiver. And it's so different than what last offseason was like where Kenny Galladay was making the headlines as the biggest free agent acquisition. There weren't a bunch of trades. Um, okay, let's move on. But, well, no, let me ask you this question, though. Do you fundamentally believe Carson Wentz helps Terry McLaurin? Because, you know, over the last two years, he's been very inaccurate. That's been the problem for Terry McLaurin is all the metrics outside of, you know, putting up league-winning fantasy numbers and receptions and, you know, yardage. It's been mm, hardly any of his passes are ever catchable, and he's dealt with this uh, rotating quarterback room. So do you really believe it? helps with Carson Wentz or is this just going to be more of the same for Terry McLaurin? I, I do think it helps. Um, Carson Wentz is better than Taylor Heineke. I mean, it's just, it, it's, that's just a fact. Um, as much as we want to uh, make fun of Carson Wentz or crap on his play, which is a lot of fun to do. I don't blame anyone for really partaking in that entertainment value. Um, he is an upgrade. Um, that being said, he is not Russell Wilson coming into the Broncos. So I'm not, you know, taking Terry McLaurin and saying, well, you're going to you're going to have 10 touchdowns and 1300 yards because you just got a slight quarterback upgrade. But I do think it'll be better than what we saw last year for Terry McLaurin. It's just it's hard for me because I think we tend to want that to be the case. Obviously, it was going to be that way with Fitzpatrick. You know, Heineke threw for 3400 yards. He missed two games. Carson Wentz threw for 3,500 in Indianapolis, and yes, you know maybe they let him throw more in Washington, but I think I am the least excited about Terry McLaurin on a fantasy basis. You know, he's very much in the DJ Moore category for me, which sure. is I love you, I'm sorry for you, but this has been three years where you can't get inside the top 20 at the position, and I'm not sure it happens with Carson Wentz. And I'm sorry to say that because he's getting paid a lot of money to – maybe be underthrown or he uh, is very good he's a very good receiver yeah. but I, I think dj moore has been the comp the last couple of years you've got extreme talent and you see the flashes and they're going to be okay for fantasy but until they can get him a quarterback that is actually good not average or below they can't be a fantasy star all right, the Seattle uh, news that we have, Rashad Penny, by far the number one running back in Seattle, according to beat reporters in the area, right now being drafted as the running back 28, dropped extremely far in the recent mock draft we did on Tuesday. It, it, Everywhere that I see, Ken Walker keeps getting drafted ahead of him, which makes no sense to me. It never has. I have never been in a league, a mock underdog or sleeper, um, where Kenneth Walker, Ken Walker now, uh, is not being drafted ahead. And Foot Clan, listen, this is this is important and big news. Uh, I mean, Bob Condotta is a great beat reporter for the Seahawks, and he's saying he's by far the number one running back in Seattle. And he, the reason, and it's un, it's important that you understand, the reason he's saying that is because he is. Yeah, they brought him back from a free agent. I mean, he was an unrestricted free agent. Do you remember and they brought him back. 2018? In 2018, the Seattle Seahawks, the same team, the same coach, they drafted in the first round a really talented running back named Rashad Penny. And everyone was hot and bothered because he was a first-round running back. And you might think, well, he, he missed some time. Up through week 14, Rashad Penny did not miss a game his rookie year, but he was a rookie during that stretch. So that's, you know, 14 weeks. I think they had their bye week in there, 13 games. In 13 games, he had 81 carries. But the incumbent, Chris Carson, missed two games and had 171 carries. They're not giving the ball to the rookie to take over this team. That's just not going to happen. That's not Pete Carroll. And I think that Rashad Penny is going to – I mean, the Until offense Until slash unless he is hurt, he will be the guy. Four out of five weeks in the top ten to end the year last year. Yeah, he's a really good running back that has not been able to stay healthy, but he is the one. He is the the running back one. He will get first dibs, and you're right. 
Obviously, maybe people are drafting Ken Walker because they're like, well, Penny's not going to be able to stay healthy. And as soon as that happens, then you'll have the backfield to yourself. That's a If that's truly what you believe and you want to try to call your shot on injury, go right ahead. I am not going to do that. I'm going to take – I'm I'm going to die on microphone <laughs> right here. Um, Can we put the plastic back in? It's actually in? lodged in Jason's throat. Yeah. Oh, I, no, I wanted, you inhaled it. I wanted it? to make sure that uh, I could always sound terrible. Um, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm going to draft the guy who is currently healthy, who is the – number one running back for the team, who is being drafted later in drafts, and uh, it seems foolish to do it otherwise. And this team has shown, you know, I don't know which of these guys are still on the depth chart because uh, I don't have the current one in front of me, but, um, you know, Travis Homer, DJ Dallas, are those two guys still on the roster there, Kyle? Do you know off the top of your head? I'll look at. I'll look it up. I mean, they, they have used a – a myriad of other options. Like you could be very disappointed in Ken Walker in redraft leagues this year. Yeah. He's a great dynasty play. The Rashad Penny deals a year, but you could be complete. You could have a guy on your roster where you, it plays out like this. You draft him ahead of Rashad Penny against what we tell you to do. You have him on your roster and you go, I'm getting no points on my bench from Ken Walker over the first six, seven weeks. You drop him. Yeah, and, and then and then maybe and then he's maybe, relevant later. Well, sure, maybe that's when Rashad Penny. Maybe Rashad Penny goes down in week ten. Are you going to hold on to Ken Walker for that week eleven chance? No, you're going to pick him up off of waivers. Are you taking Damian Pierce in Houston under the promise that he may have that role on a team that you don't like, or are you taking Ken Walker in the promise that you it, know? If they both cost the same, you're taking I, I, I would take Walker because of the talent and, and draft capital, but they don't cost the same. Kenneth Walker's being drafted in the top 30 running backs right now. Yeah, so yeah, D Travis Homer and DJ Dallas both still on the roster. Chris Carson technically still on the roster, even though we may or may not see him. Like We forget, but if for some reason he plays, you think they're going to give the ball to Ken Walker over Chris Carson if Carson can play? If Carson is active, and I don't expect him to ever take another NFL snap, but Pete Carroll is such a loyal type of guy that when he brings his guys back, he will make sure that the, the if Chris Carson works his way back to health and is active, he'll get the ball probably over Rashad Penny. All right, one more piece of news here. The Athletics, uh, Ben uh, Standig writes that Brian Robinson could be the answer for Washington in short yardage and goal line situations. So, again, this is very, this is not coming from, you know, anything we've seen yet on the field, but it's one of the red flags that exists for Antonio Gibson is the team's investment in Brian Robinson. Yeah, I mean, he brings up in... Uh, Fourth-round rookie Brian Robinson Jr. Uh, was he fourth? I thought he was might have been third. Um, maybe I was wrong. Uh, but the uh, the the article brings up the fact that Antonio Gibson, who has struggled so much with his fumbling problems, and and the fact that you go out and you draft a guy who is known for the exact opposite, this will be an interesting camp battle to watch. Antonio Gibson has been someone in the drafts that I've been doing that I man every time I see him dropping to value, I'm like, this is a guy who he only, was third round by the way. Yeah, that's what I thought. You're so smart, Jason. Th thank you, Kyle. You are so wise to it was, say that. It may or may not have been Kyle that said fourth round originally. Oh, so, man. I just, I just, you know. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I Antonio Gibson has always been good for fantasy. He's you know, been top 12 in the last two years, and he's dropping, so he could be a value. But if he fumbles. Well, the funny thing was this whole uh, big salad discussion about Sean Drone having that – player on your roster that just kind of gives you you know the Clinton Portis of old right where you just you lock them in your lineup and you get your 10 to 14 points and you just feel comfortable there eating your vegetables the first player that popped into my head for that was Antonio Gibson because he has had the opportunity to you know to get into the end zone and despite all of the kind of red flags I was like oh Gibson kind of fits that mold but if by some chance those touchdown opportunities go down and you are losing third down to a newly re-signed J.D. McKissick, who just went back to the team for that role. Yeah, it, it's it, a red. It, it's worrisome. No, this if he's a big salad, there are a ton of seeds and and nuts in this salad, and you have a gallbladder issue. This is a very dangerous salad for you to eat. So with the gallbladder, you don't want seeds. But you you can't always break those down. Well. Really? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. 
So, <laughs> but Clyde Edwards Alaire is in good shape for that. Yes, yeah, okay. because he it doesn't even matter anymore. Um, just I mean, point of do you do you enjoy like a, a nut salad? Do you like candied walnuts? Do you like candied walnuts in candied a salad? Candied walnuts in a salad are uh are very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You enjoy that? That's the now, candied, see, I, candied, I, candied walnut. I agree with you. But I broke a tooth on a candied walnut once in a salad, and now I'm a little bit gun shy. Wow. Well, that sounds like a but terrible you're, you're candied a big, walnut. You're a big nut guy. All right. Uh, taking a quick break, then into the mailbag. Um, all right, Jason. Uh, we don't have, I mean, we don't have oh, Mike no. in the building. So who and does the mailbag? Drop I would say today? anybody that has been inaccurate about like draft. Oh, like someone, rounds. Like if you were like, oh yeah, he was Brian a Robinson's a fourth rounder, fourth rounder, but he's not. He's a right. third rounder, and and you just punished someone else today for being wrong about a T-shirt. Maybe you should be punished today for being wrong about a draft pick. Kyle, the Borgogan, he's got the mailbag drop. Mailbag. Mailbag. <laughs> that was mail, great. The mail was fine, but the <laughs> bag, the, the bag part got really off the rails there. That reminded me a little bit of like it was like a deep voice mailbag drop, but it was like one of the, uh, you know, the long saws you cut a tree down, and you know, you like hit the middle of the saw and it goes. Sure, yeah, um, and, thank and you. Also, that was not remotely his voice. He put on a voice for the mailbag. He put well, I look protective. Yeah. Uh he doesn't want to be too vulnerable. Get your stats right. All right. We're gonna answer a, a ton of questions on today's show, have some debates, discussions. If you have a question for the fantasy footballers, go to the website, thefantasyfootballers.com dot com, click the submit a question button, or dial the voicemail hotline, three zero two four six four T F F B and we'll jump right into a voicemail. Hey guys. Uh Quick question for you in the Dynasty League. Um, I just traded Tyree Kill and the 201 in the rookie draft this year for Austin Eckler. Did I win this one? Right, let me know. Well, I mean, it sounds hilarious to answer it, but we'll find out. I mean, I think it's about your confidence level and what Tyreek will be. The majority of opinion out there is that he won't be what he was, and he won't be able to be what he was. I do think there's still a chance he is going to do what he's done very similarly from a statistical output in Miami. Maybe that's 10%, maybe that's 15%. But I think there's a chance of that, but I have no problem with this trade. If you needed a running back and you trade Tyreek in the 201 for Eckler, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I certainly value Austin Eckler this year worth that. But when you're talking about the 201, the rookie pick, you're talking about a dynasty league. Um, and while, while Tyree kill is, is older than Austin Eckler, not in like positional age, right? But, uh, Tyree kill is 28 years old, just signed a massive contract with the dolphins. He's got another three years left. No problem. Austin Eckler being, uh, you know, undersized for a high workload running back. He's going to soon get to the age where I, I, I believe that the chargers next year will have to address the position and they cannot rely on him to be a a guy that's going to touch the ball, you know, 250 plus times and be a goal line back next, you know, the following season, the following season, the following season. So I think you've got a shorter shelf life in Dynasty with Austin Eckler. Is your yeah, I mean is your risk of outcomes though more vast in in the immediate term with Tyreek Hill? Like do you, where where do you think Tyreek Hill could finish? What's the range, like the highest and the lowest that you think Tyreek could finish in Miami? Um, I, I think could he highest, be could be outside the top twenty. I think that is possible. Okay, outside um, the top twenty-four. I have him ranked right now as my wide receiver ten. Um, I I I think a low end wide receiver two would be his worst possible outcome. You know, injuries aside, I do think his his upside is still probably you know wide receiver five or six um this season he's obviously hyper talented they paid him a lot they're going to target him a lot um it's just a matter of how much you believe in Tua 
So he's got a pretty wide range of outcomes. Austin Eckler is going to be a top 10 running back for sure this year, barring injury. Um, but the, the long-term outlook, probably better for Tyreek than, um, than it is for Austin Eckler. And then you're adding another pick. So I, I'm fine with it either way, uh, but I would probably in a vacuum take the Tyreek and the Tua one. All right, Chino Eric 12 says, if I don't take a running back in the first two rounds, is that a bad strategy? It's a great question to have. It's not necessarily a bad strategy to take no running backs in the first two rounds, but it it very easily can turn you to a place that is a bad strategy. Um, historically, over the last several years, there's a running back dead zone. If you're unfamiliar with the running back dead zone, uh, it's running backs that are drafted – I think really between rounds four and seven, some people say three through six, um, those running backs have tended to be horrible draft picks for fantasy. And the reason why makes complete sense. Running backs start to go away and you look at which running backs are left. And so you're worried that you're not going to get one when you're in rounds three, four, five, six later in the draft. And so you overdraft these running backs that really aren't that good because they're kind of all that's left. And so what happens there is your there are wide receivers that are just good, that you know are good in rounds three, four, five, six. You They're super involved because there's so many more wide receivers to a team than there are running backs. And so you end up taking a mediocre running back over a good wide receiver, and that hurts you in fantasy. So if I don't take a running back the first two rounds, I am probably going more towards the zero RB strategy maybe I take one in the third but I'm going to still load up on wide receivers and hopefully you you have two of the best wide receivers in the first two rounds you just need to make sure that you have a strength don't undo your strength by drafting weaker running backs over better wide receivers there's an article on the website titled are we good at drafting mid-round running backs the TLDR of that article is no yeah we're not good at it now on the mock draft episode um you know, uh, James Conner went in the third round. Mm -hmm. Great pick. Because uh, you made it. Well, yeah. Yeah. It was great. Um, who, who did I take in the third? I think Elijah Mitchell was my fourth round pick. David Montgomery. David Montgomery in the third. So that's what you're looking at uh, as potential RB1s for that roster. If you were to go right into running back after the first two rounds. Here's a follow-up, though. Kind of the inverse question from Duke Silver 25. Is it crazy to start with your first three picks as running backs. Because you could go Dalvin Cook and then pick up Aaron Jones in the second and then James Conner in the third round. Yeah, I mean, I, I, oh, here's, here's something that people should understand. There are so many ways to successfully draft in fantasy. Zero RB works. You can win massive tournament championships doing that and not drafting your first running back till round eight. Uh, loading up on running backs early like this, the first three picks, this can work as well. It's really a matter of taking the best players that are available to make the biggest impact. I think I like in, in, in my experience when I've drafted, it's not common, but when I've gone running back, running back, running back, because there's just, wow, this guy shouldn't be there. And I have, if I'm confident, I have three studs. I really enjoy the rest of the draft because I don't worry about running back pretty much at all from well, then on out. I think that helped the strength of the second half of my draft on Tuesday was I went three running backs in rounds two, three, and four and felt like I had carte blanche the rest of the draft because I felt like I had a lot of depth. Um, I, you know, sure, anybody can win any different way. I definitely, on this show, we've talked about it extensively. It's very hard to find running backs that get consistent volume that, you know, you're going to need depth at the position. Whether you draft them in a row or not, you're going to need depth at running back. Between bye weeks and injuries, people are going to miss weeks. So I'm with you. I think that, you know, I don't go into a draft and say I have to take three running backs to start it, but if I end up there, I'm not, I'm not you know, freaked out for the rest of my draft. There are wide receivers that you can, you can piece it together at wide receiver much easier than middle round um, running backs or late round running backs, you know the people that win with the late RB strategy, you have to hit. I mean, you have mm -hmm. to you have to make the right call. You are you might see championships won by those teams, but 
you don't see every one where they don't come to fruition either. And it's, um, it's difficult to identify those guys. Yeah. I mean, obviously if you drafted some of the wide receivers that got injured last year and then you didn't have any running backs, it's, you know, some of that is a little bit out of your control. You still have to draft the right players in no matter what strategy. But if you go running back, running back, running back to start, now you get to shotgun. There are so many wide receivers in those middle rounds that have a wide range of outcomes that, you know, a DK Metcalf, Deontay Johnson, those type of players that they could be great, but you're worried about the quarterback situation. They're not all going to be great, and they're not all going to be terrible. So if you shotgun wide receivers the rest of your draft, you're going to hit. Want to get Mike Williams in the fifth? Yeah, you're going you're gonna to hit on a couple of them. Uh, let's go with an Instagram question from Daylong. He says, uh, how do we feel about the walrus this season? I have I have kind of gone on a roller coaster with the walrus. When I first statted the Las Vegas Raiders out, I was surprised how high the walrus was for me. Darren Waller still looked um you know like like a a very good option at tight end. The longer the time has gone on and you think about okay, you're you're Darren Waller has completely succeeded on the back of massive target share. That is that is why he's been so good is because he has just been a target monster for the position at tight end. Uh, his target share 2019, 2020, 2021 was 24%, 28%, and 23% in those games played. Um, the corresponding next highest teammates target share is 14%, 15%. Last year, Hunter Renfro was up to 21%. You got a guy in town here who's going to – like. He is the lead dog. Devontae Adams is going to have the highest target share. And if Devontae Adams comes in with a 25-plus percent target share, a 30% target share, you know, like Devontae Adams has been accustomed to, Darren Waller is the number one guy that's going to take a hit on this offense. Yeah, it's it's tough. You look at those two and you say, well, maybe that's maybe that's the best combo in terms of passing options in the NFL. But Waller's success came when he was competing with Nelson Aguilar or Tyrell Williams mm -hmm. in terms of target competition. So, you know, you can certainly you can certainly make – he can have a great season even if the target share is reduced if he gets into the end zone nine times like he did in 2020 as opposed to three times like he did in 2019. I mean, that's a – for him to finish number three and number two at the position – in back-to-back -back years, but have that kind of a difference in touchdown totals, you know, there's different ways to make a great season. Yeah, I, I think the reality here is that Darren Waller is going to be good this year. He's not He's not going to disappear. Obviously, coverage will be easier for him because of Devontae Adams. He'll be good. Where's but he being drafted right he, now? That's what I was going to bring up. He's being drafted at the top of the fourth round right now, and he is not – Darren Waller is not going to be an elite – difference maker like he's not going to be Travis Kelsey this year to the rest of the tight ends he's not going to be someone that just completely dominates every single week at tight end does that mean you just pass on him and you pass on like a Kittle too do you believe that about George Kittle George that Kittle. he's not a positional advantage either because uh, I think they're going aren't they going pretty close together yeah George Kittle's a couple spots ahead like 308 versus 401 so they're they're right there and when you're on the board there you're talking about guys you know James Connors at the 3-4 turn um you've got Deontay Johnson, Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf. Yeah, you can take Mike Williams instead of Darren Waller if you wanted to. Yeah, there's a lot of other players that I think Portland are going to make a bigger impact in those rounds than the impact Darren Waller will make. It's not to say he's going to be bad. It's just to say to take a, a onesie position, the tight end position, that isn't a true elite difference maker the way he's been in the past is probably a mistake for fantasy. Okay. All right. Uh, Instagram question from Mr. Fletcher 18. Does Andy have a mustache because of Top Gun? Great question. If you have been watching, um, you might watch YouTube and say, Andy has a mustache. And it's the an reason, That's an appropriate thing to say. The reason you would say that is because you look at it and you're like, okay, I see a mustache. Now, you don't have a mustache, according to your wife, right? Because you're not allowed to have a mustache. I did. 
slowly shaved the surrounding beard <laughs> one like one um attachment lower at a time one click until she noticed oh she has finally noticed. oh yeah okay yeah eventually and i did i even had a whole morning once i made the final click i had a whole morning where i was just conveniently like covering my face like the, i'm putting the shirt on and she walked in the room and i didn't pull it all the way on or i like had the towel in front of my face i remember that morning because when you came into the studio it was like oh my gosh you have a mustache now and which it's not i kind of trimmed it and so it's not really outrageous right now not not outrageous. it was much longer but let's get back to the heart of the question is this mustache that you have due to the maverick uh movie sensation might i add phenomenal film um and the mustache is in that movie no that no, it's it. not. But it is a wonderful coincidence because most people have thought that, and it also brought it brought the mustache back into the the limelight, which where it belongs. And then I went and watched uh, Jurassic uh, World, the third one, with my son. Oh, how was it? It was good. Chris Pratt's mustache looked great in that, uh, which he also has. I mean, if he if he's rocking a mustache, I can get. And uh, look, I mostly I was bored with you know? your life. Yeah, I just bored with my. Just needed a mustache. Sometimes everybody who has facial hair knows that every once in a while you wonder, what if I just mix it up a little bit, right? No, I don't need to wonder because if well, I shave my beard, I'm a fat face. <laughs> so like, there's no question. I don't ever think like, oh, I wonder how I would look. I've if known I... you longer without a beard than with a beard. Fat well, face. Well, yeah, I wasn't always fat, so <laughs> you've known me since high school. But no, I do recommend the gradient strategy if you are trying. If because I did ask first. I mean, the strategy right. was like, hey, wife. Yeah. That's how I call it. I say, hey, Absolutely. wife. Absolutely. I say, that's hey, how, wife. That's how we talk to our wives. Um, <laughs> that's not true. I said, hey, no. Bree, uh, what do you think about a mustache? In which she said, no. <laughs> so, so then you take the gradient strategy, and before you know it, it's like she sees me a lot. It, she didn't even notice. Yeah. It's it's the whole boiling a frog. In If you drop a right, frog into right. hot water, he'll yeah. jump out. If you Boil your wife in a hot pan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kyle, you're on my team, right? Team yeah. mix it up. Yeah, let's mix it up. I mean, the ladies love it. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of a... <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe they do. You're not a big mustache fan. I think that a mustache can look good on certain people, and I will say this. Uh-oh. I th- no, I think, I think you look fine with a mustache. Sometimes mustaches make people just look real creepy. Well, I don't... Yeah, I'm not... Real creepy. I, I was going to say, I, I definitely think I'm more creepy now than before. Yeah, I mean, it I mean, just made it's, you it's a little neutral. creepy. I'm at least a little creepier. Yeah, there's no, there's, there's yeah. no non creepy mustache. It's no. just, it's back to the gray. I've gotten to- the Tom Gun, and then that I look like a cop. Okay, you know, why, why is it that cops? Because it is like known. It's like connected with being a cop is to have a mustache. Why is, why did that happen? Why did, did cops decide like a bunch of them got together and were like, this is our look, or what was the? I guess so. I think maybe there's uh, famous mustached police officers in cinema. Okay. All right. No answers from the deucers on these. No, you guys are not authority these are too, on this matter. Too deep. Too deep of questions on the show. Um, Instagram question. How early is too early to draft Alan Lazard? Uh, <laughs> the answer is, if you're asking that question, where you want to draft him is too early, in my opinion. <laughs> right? I mean, if you're in a place where you're going, man, I just, I've got to have Alan Lazard. How soon am I allowed to take him? Yeah. So Alan Lazard, uh, who opened the show, good friend of the show here, um, and great friend of the Mike's, Lazard King. The yeah. Lazard King. He's currently in sleeper being drafted about the end of the 10th round. So usually when guys that's are. That's not too soon. <laughs> <laughs> that's not too soon. But you're. The heart of this question is someone really wants to walk away from their draft with Lazard. He's going in the back of the 10th. So how far ahead, if you say, I believe Alan Lazard is going to be the dude for the Green Bay Packers, the wide receiver one, double-digit touchdowns, if that's your belief, how high do you need to take him, or or is it a mistake? Um, you know, perfect I mean, six, example. Sixth round is fine if that's what you – if you, like – Believe it. Wow, that is spicy. Six run. So you're willing to go all the way up to where? You just said that he's going to have double-digit touchdown. If you believe he's a double-digit touchdown, wide receiver one, extraordinaire for Aaron Rodgers, yeah, sixth round is not the end of the world. You I shouldn't s- do it. I still think that would be a mistake, even if he does do that, because you don't need to draft him in the sixth round. Well, sure. Did so you try to trap me there? No, you just you jumped in too hot. You went right into the boiling water. I would rather be dead than draft him there, to be clear. 
Well, I I think that is I think that is pretty clear. Um, I think the eighth round is where I would say you know eighth the the sixth and seventh round still has some really good players in it that I would not be reaching so far above average draft position that no one else is going to grab. I mean, you know your league, right? Like if you've got a crazy Packers fan, I hate those. But oh, way. they're the worst. And yeah, we where, are say dra- this. where are you drafting, Aaron, uh, Alan Lazard? There, Al. First fifth, round, fifth round. Fifth round. Okay, okay, so I guess maybe the sixth you, you're not going to get. In general, though, I think that if you really want him, um, look where his ADP is. Two rounds is kind of the cap. I think if you go two rounds ahead of a guy that's in the tenth, you'll always get them. Well, if the, you go higher than that, you're missing out on better players in the seventh round, in the sixth round, and sacrificing those for someone that you could have gotten later. It's and this happens in the, the cer- NFL draft. The certainty of well, I said that really slowly. Certainty. certainty. The certainty of that gets far more ambiguous the later the draft goes. So saying that you definitely get a better player in the sixth round than you get the eighth round becomes far less certain. It's it's you're way down in the draft. I mean, you don't see a world where uh, Gabe Davis is clearly going ahead of Alan Lazard. Is that he is? And that's right. He's going in the eighth round right now. So yeah. two rounds ahead. There is it's fifty fifty in my mind whether Lazard or Gabe Davis have a better season. So that two round gap is it doesn't matter to me. And Lazard's an eighth round pick in in best ball right now too. So uh, that fits with the two round rule that you just said. You could go sixth. Yeah, I mean, g- get your guy. We we always recommend getting the guy that you want and being happy with your team. But we definitely want you to maximize your roster. We've been doing so many best ball drafts around here, Kyle and I. And um, whenever we make the decision, like, oh, I really want Tim Patrick. This just happened to me. I wanted Tim Patrick. I had Russell Wilson. I wanted to complete the stack. And I was looking. I, I kind of needed another quarterback. Justin Fields was on the board. But I really wanted Tim Patrick. And I made the decision to just wait and continue playing the ADP game. I wasn't going to take Patrick one round ahead, and I I took Justin Fields, and then I still got Tim Patrick. Those things are the ways that you maximize your roster. You, obviously, you're gambling a little bit, um, but that's why you need to factor in ADP when you're, you know, your platform's ADP when you're making these decisions because they affect the average fantasy guy tremendously. Well, and we're going to, especially in best ball, where the ADP is just sitting in front of you every single draft. We're going to talk more about some of the trends in best ball ADP here shortly. More importantly, I asked the question, why why the mustache for the cops? Uh, some trace it back to the Old West. This makes so much sense, oh, okay. by the way. We've got an answer. And the ornate mustaches were common in the 19th century. Why it herp? Yeah, I mean, rural police forces especially trace much, much of their terminology and tradition back to the frontier sheriffs. Yeah. And wear that facial hair to honor the sheriffs. That is such not true because if they were <laughs> such not true, as I say, if they were really honoring where that heritage of those those great sheriffs came from, I want to see a modern day the handlebars handlebar mustache on a on a police officer. Yeah, I mean, I think that there some of those do exist, but it's they're in Canada. It's a lot of work. But the Mounties? Oh, the Mounties definitely have handlebars. They go handlebars? Yeah, with a hat like that, I think it's law. I like my mustache even more thinking about Wild West. I'm a big fan. Oh, you need to get your mustache a little bigger if if you're uh, if you're gonna go Wild West homage. All right, it's underdog fantasy time. Best ball breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. All right. Every week leading up to the season, we're giving tips, we're giving insights, we're giving observations for playing best ball and underdog fantasy. I uh, did a few drafts this week, actually. Um, I mentioned getting Mark Ingram with the final pick, and then the next day we get more news about a potential Alvin Kamara suspension. Delighted by that because I needed – like we have a bunch of articles up on the website for best ball, and we also have that ideal amount of running backs and wide receivers and quarterbacks – that you should have on your best ball teams that correlated to victory, mm-hmm. right? To winning these these competitions. And I really needed one more running back. And that was the last pick of the entire draft. Yeah, no, that, that was great. If you're talking about, I know this isn't the, the, the information we're giving, uh, but since this is the Foot Clan listening, you know who I think is a great, I've seen him basically available at your last pick in most of these drafts. And there will come a time where 
news changes, and then he will definitely not be available with your last pick. If you're doing drafts right now, grab Will Fuller in your in your very last round because if he's he'll sign somewhere, he will. And as soon as he signs somewhere, he's not going to be there in your 18th round. So that's a little, little tip. Were we talking about Will Fuller the other day, Kyle? About like wondering what the heck's going on with this guy? Yeah, there's news that he's contemplating what he wants to do with life and football. Yeah, I did just he wants to play it, Kyle. <laughs> After Jason's no, I'm just saying <laughs> advice. Like, this someone needs it's, when someone brings money and needs a wide receiver. Who's out there right now? Like the pe- a team will need a wide receiver. You're not going to go after Odell Beckham with his. I injury. mean, to be fair, Will Fuller wasn't even out there last year. Well, I mean, he's he's I mean, never that is, that is an never, issue. He's never out there. But if you get four or five games, so I mentioned average draft position. Um, if you're playing best ball, look, you do those drafts. The ADP is sitting right in front of your face, right? So players are making decisions, playing the game, playing the gamble that Jason's talking about, and there are ebbs and flows. It's like a market, right? I mean, think players move around all the time, and you're playing the ADP game trying to get ahead of the curve. Um, and as the average draft position rises and falls, you can miss out on players that were values, right? Like, you know, James Conner was going in the fifth round of best ball drafts for a long time. Now he's in the third, the third round. Still a value. So, but not as good. Yeah, maybe. And uh, players, you know, they can get hyped up. You get a piece of news that comes through. Uh, you get entire teams that are impacted. The the Browns, for example, all the pieces when you start talking about a Deshaun Watson suspension are you know lowering in best ball drafts. So, wanted to just look at a few of the players, kind of comparing mid May average draft position to this week. So it's like a month and a half, Jason. Okay. Matt Ryan is one of the players that has moved up. He's moved from the quarterback 22 to the quarterback 20. That's a full round higher. And the Colts favored to win the AFC South. So, you know, they're the front runners in the division. Maybe What's the takeaway for you? Maybe you can grab Ryan as your QB2 a little bit later? Uh, yeah, I mean, if he's moved up a full round, I haven't personally been crazy bullish on Matt Ryan, but being quarterback 20... Um, you, you. I would personally rather have him at the the peak of his value, meaning before when he was not moving up higher. Uh, the underdog is a four point per passing touchdown league. Matt Ryan's not gonna be running in a bunch of touchdowns, so I, I think this is uh you know negative for his value. Confidence has uh gone up in Matt Ryan recently. It has gone down for Patrick Mahomes. Now we mentioned him as a potential bust. He's, Coincidence? Uh, maybe not, but he moved from the beginning of the fourth back to the four-five turn. Uh, any thoughts on, you know, are people just afraid of Patrick Mahomes? Is he a potential value if the if the ADP continues to drop? Yeah, I mean, when I was anti Patrick Mahomes, it was entirely one hundred percent based on the ADP, and and really that was in more redraft leagues where he's in the third round. If he's dropping to the fifth round, um. Much uh, more interesting. Much more interesting, and unlike in years past. In years past, if you wanted to stack with Patrick Mahomes, you had to pay up for Kelsey or pay up for Hill, right? And, 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 and thankfully, you knew that those guys would get the targets, but right now there are cheap options later in the draft to take your shot on. You know, if you think Juju Smith-Schuster is going to break out and, and be a 130-target guy for this offense, well, now you can affordably get a Patrick Mahomes stack um, if he's dropping to the fifth. This one was maybe the most interesting move for me. Travis Etienne in the last month and a half has moved from the running back 22 to the running back 17, up almost two full rounds in best ball. Now he's ranked at that 22 spot in our consensus rankings, but now maybe it getting into the too expensive territory, there's still a lot of chatter about what James Robinson's availability will be at some point during the year. Do you think that this ADP movement with ETN just relates to him being young, explosive, and unseen on a field before and the potential? Yeah, it, I would expect Travis ETN to continue to move the longer that James Robinson is out, the more that it seems like he's going to be the guy. But news is going to change over the course of this offseason with Travis ETN. Um, if, you know, it's funny because what Travis ETN does this year doesn't change based on where you're drafting him in your drafts. But you got to pay attention to the news cycle because 
it's when it looks bad for Travis Etienne that's when you want to draft him. Does that make right, sense? Which, no, it does, and it's too expensive for me at this price. For, yeah, because for sure. there's a lot of question marks. I still, I, even to this day, there are plugged-in beat reporters that genuinely feel confident. Like, I don't that know James that, Robinson trust, will that be James back. Robinson is the RB1 for this team when he gets back. They're not talking about the injury a lot. They're more talking about the depth chart and just, yeah, James Robinson's the guy. Yeah, and it, it, I mean, coming off of his injury is really tough, but the, the more Travis Etienne costs, that risk of him not even being the starter is is dramatic. Uh, some reactionary movement. Cameron Brait moved from undrafted to the 14th, 15th round. He's a player we brought up with Gronk's retirement. Um, you know, a TD or bust type of player. I think I said he had five catches and – or seven catches in five games without Gronk. So you're not getting volume from Cameron Bray. I'm not chasing Cameron Bray, and neither is Jason and the fart sound. Yeah, that's uh, my take. Cordero Patterson has been down more than 15 picks uh, over the last month and a half. Could be valuable as an RB3 on your roster. I do see him drop. He dropped in our mock draft and redraft as well. Yeah, if he's getting to 100 overall, the running back 32 – he is too important to the team and was obviously very good last year for fantasy. So I, I nobody wants the old guy on a bad team, but everybody wants more fantasy points than what you're drafting. And that's what Cordero is right now. Paris Campbell, who's been running exclusively with the first team wide receiver for the Colts. I have to remind you three seasons, about eight games played total in three years, something like that. Um, but he's running with the first team, and you know my, it's Michael Pittman and on that Indianapolis offense. So people are kind of going around that news and, and looking at him as a later round flyer because he can beat out Alec Pierce. He could beat out um, Ash, Ashley Doolin. Ashley Doolin. What did I say? <laughs> Ashley. Ashlyn Doolin. <laughs> Ashley Doolin. Um, I, I think the Paris Campbell news is why Matt Ryan has been going high. I have always been pessimistic towards Paris Campbell, so maybe that's why I'm not buying. I mean, obviously, if Paris Campbell did the Devontae Parker thing and just actually had a good breakout season uh, four years into his career, then, yeah, Matt Ryan's going to be great. And Paris Campbell, you get that cheap stack, that's going to work out great. I am pessimistic. I don't think Paris Campbell ever gets it done, in which case that's why I'm, I'm not high on Matt Ryan. And the last one here, Traylon Burks has dropped from wide receiver 34 to wide receiver 40. Confidence in Burks has proportionally gone down with the confidence in Robert Woods that has risen with his health. You know, there are other rookies even now going behind him. Chris Olave, for example, he's no longer the first wide receiver off the board. Is there a point? A point where this slide is is too far, and you will be in on a later Traylon Burks. Um, are the, you? Are you? How are you feeling? Because I know you were a. I was. You're a Traylon truther. Yes, I was. Uh, very. But the bullish. truth, Burks. Oh, mm, uh, yeah. No. Not, that means late in the show. I yeah, know. it is. That's. I'm, I'm. I'm happy about that. I liked it. <laughs> Thank you, Al. I liked it too. Oh, oh man, this, this. deuces! <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um. <laughs> Traylon Burks is someone that I, I think was very talented. He checked a ton of boxes for me in the pre-draft, um, pre-NFL draft system, and then and then inherited such a great landing spot having A.J. Brown leave that I was very, very bullish. But the reports out of camp, I mean, one, he's not there. He's not practicing. He's not available. Um, this is not the head coach that wants guys who can't get it done. Uh, Vrabel... Was a, another mustached man's man. Um, Thank you. You're you're welcome. Um, and so, yeah, I'm I'm like, I need good news on Traylon Burks before I can get back in. That being said, this is where you know if if the news is all bad for now, sometimes you need to buy the bad news, buy the dip on news because that's all it is. It, you know, official training camps haven't really started still yet. Still a first-round pick. It's He's still a first-round pick. He's still talented. He's still got opportunity. Uh, you know, we're not even to the preseason yet. So, it's tough because – He's just he's just trailing the other guys in the in the locker room. Much better. Much better that time. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that there is a point where he will drop, that he becomes a value based on 
buying negative news and just buying into the talent of him over simple, you know, beat reporters saying that oh, there's an asthma problem. All right, that was Best Ball Breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. Start playing on Underdog today, right now. They'll match your first deposit up to $100 if you use the code BALLERS. Okay, you can watch the show, youtube.com slash thefantasyfootballers. Make sure you, you subscribe and click the bell. Go over there right now on YouTube because we do a lot of live events, especially in August, uh, in early September, as the season gets started. So you want to know when we are going live. Like I said, Twitter, the F, uh, Twitter at the FF Ballers, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. And our draft analyzer comes out tomorrow. So everybody that has uh, the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus, you can take your – even if you're doing a mock draft and you want to see how it goes, you can you can plug that team in, see what we would say about, you know, your, your team breakdown, areas of opportunity, maybe some things you could have done different or things that with this roster you would look at in the season, whether you're dynasty or mock drafting or whatever, that's all out. It launches again tomorrow. If yeah, you don't have it yet, you can get it at ultimatedraftkit.com. The UDK Plus has the draft analyzer the in-season uh, DFS information, the uh, the ultimate draft kit, and uh, Dynasty Pass. I bet there is a feature upgrade you don't even know is about to happen for the draft analyst. I'll or bet, do you know? I'll bet I know. Why don't well, you just... Right now, uh, you, you can tell add, me, and, you I'll tell, add, I'll, I'll, and I'll tell you if I tell know. Tell you if I know. Uh, you can add teams manually in the draft analyzer. You can add teams with ESPN. Uh, you can import ESPN teams. You can import sleeper teams. Yes. So you do know. I do know. Yeah. yeah. Yahoo is coming. Yes. You did not know. Well, <laughs> you told me it was here, and then I said that, and then it was like, well, it's not here, so I assume it's coming someday. It's, is it really coming? Very in? soon. All right. Let's so go. So you'll be able to import your Yahoo team as well. We've also made, Kyle, I know you were instrumental in working out some more um, uh, upgrades to the draft analyzer. We're looking at some things like uh, strength of schedule. Uh, we're trying to give you some uh, just, I, I guess I would say, deeper insights to the roster we want to keep improving this product every year and uh, you'll get the opportunity to get a grade from us uh, figure out where your team aligns with which fantasy footballer in terms of you know do our rankings make you a jason guy hope or, so or, or hope gal. so for your sake yeah so you can check that out ultimate draftkit.com that'll do it for today's show mike will be back from hope, iceland next week yeah hope, hopefully that that, that's true. Unless he's coming via like boat or something, in which case it'll be probably week. a little longer. All right, that'll do it. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate you guys. Happy to be here. <laughs> All right, see ya. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.